Uh, yeah, so I uh, wanted to talk about social strategy for today. Um, specific, and, and to be a little more specific, uh, th these are some questions that have um, arisen and, re you know, and continue to re-arise, um, uh, particularly in the collapse of our former organization, the ISO. Um, you know, a lot of uh, comrades, probably the bulk went into the DSA, and uh, many, and, and, and those people and many others, you know, came to kind of question a lot of um, the, the basic strategy of, of like how we organize and, and that kind of thing. And so, in, and since then, these questions have been raised and have been, you know, being discussed by, in the RSN, in our local groups, and, um, uh, and elsewhere, like, like in Tempest, um, uh, in a uh, new formation that is, um, well, I don't know, maybe calling it a formation is a little premature, but a new uh, attempt at some type of grouping um, that, that was called by our comrade Justin Aker Chacon, um, called uh, the, the Revolutionary Socialist Organizing Project, um, and, and elsewhere, you know, um, on the revolutionary left. So, uh, so Steve and I were uh, trying to get our thoughts together to uh, talk about this question within the RSN a couple weeks ago, and then also in this initial uh, revolutionary socialist organizing project meeting. And so uh, we wrote this document, um, and uh, you know that I'm basically just going to read a after this, but um, and then we'll talk about. It, so cool, cool, um, great. Uh, the only time the working class has taken political power from the capitalists on a national scale was in the Russian Revolution. This was the only time that workers smashed the capitalist state and created their own democratically run state based on workers' councils. Russian workers made enormous strides towards socialism in a short period before the Stalinist counter-revolution snuffed out their attempt. Russia in 1917 was not the only time workers had the chance to seize power. In the century since then, dozens of mass revolutionary movements have emerged from China to Spain, Chile to Iran, Poland to Algeria, and many places in between. But Russia had something the rest did not a mass, well-rooted, revolutionary socialist workers' party. The Bolsheviks organized above ground and underground for nearly 20 years before their 1917 victory. Even before the revolutionary situation, they had tens of thousands of militants drawn from a working class of only a few million. They provided political education, intervened in struggle, and gained the respect of the class, while organizing the most militant working class activists around Marxism. Since that time, Marxists have seen the Bolshevik model as the best strategy. Uh, under capitalism, working class consciousness is mixed. In workplaces, there are militants and those who kiss up to the boss, racists and anti-racists, sexists and liberationists, etc. The Bolshevik strategy was to organize the most advanced workers leading struggles into a party. I'm sorry. Uh, the Bolshevik strategy was to organize the most advanced workers who were leading struggles and to organize them into a party that, that could then organize workers as a whole. Uh, in a revolutionary situation, this party could convince the working class to take power and to form its own government. The failure of at least some of the potential revolutions listed above can be chalked up to the, the to uh, missing a large, strong, well-rooted revolutionary party. In a crisis, if the revolutionary option does not seem viable because it is not because it is not large enough uh, or potentially successful enough, uh, people will turn to other options, and the potential for workers' power will be lost. Working class struggle is inevitable under capitalism. Strikes will break out, workers will fight back, oppressed people will organize against oppression. Vic uh, victory, however, depends on organization and clear politics. 
the goal of Marxists should be to contribute to the organization and political clarity needed. What this means concretely will vary from place to place and time to time. The exact road to a revolutionary party will differ. Since 2008, there has been mass support in the US for some kind of socialism, especially among young people and people of color. There are more people in socialist organizations than, it, than at any time since the 1960s. As part of this phenomenon, thousands of people have become Marxists or very open to Marxism. Uh, the sales of the Communist Manifesto have gone through the roof. Capitalism, uh, capitalism ultimately creates its own grave dig diggers, the revolutionary working class. On the way to that, it is creating millions who hate the system for its poverty, oppression, exploitation, war, and planet destroying global warming. Young people today, for the first time in generations, cannot expect to live as well as their parents. They face a future of precarity, disease, and the potential collapse of civilization. There is a paradox at the heart of these developments. A decline in Marxist organization has accompanied the rise in interest in Marxism. Due in part, part to this weakness, the interest in socialism has so far taken the form of membership in the DSA, yep. which we consider unalterably reformist and subservient to a capitalist party. There are also many thousands of people interested in Marxism who are not in the DSA. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, so, some are involved in social movements or labor organizing, while others have not yet found a way to be involved in struggle. The crisis of Marxism today in the US is a crisis of organization. We need a Bolshevik type revolutionary socialist party based on an actual working class vanguard, the leaders in struggle. However, we cannot just snap our fingers and create it. It cannot be built in the absence of two conditions, widespread working class radicalization and the organized intervention of Marxists. We have no control over the first condition and we must dedicate ourselves to the second. In order to have the ability to influence the developing working class vanguard, a Marxist organization must be large and implanted in all sections of the class. It must have cadres who can interact with labor and social movements across the country. It must have people developed enough politically to carry Marxist methods and arguments into every struggle. It needs militants trained in action and in theory. It needs activist writers and activist speakers and per, uh, permanent persuaders, publications, and a large profile. Marxists in the US today are far are far away from having a large organization that can fulfill these tasks. The first step is to organize and unite with the Marxists who are now scattered. Instead of being individually involved in labor and social movements, we need an organization that we can concentrate, that, that can concentrate our influence. Winning the maximum number of people to Marxism requires current Marxists to be united and to put out a clear message. We reject the opposition to building sol uh, solid Marxist organizations that is epitomized by Hal Draper's critique of the micro sect. Draper's position says that mass revolutionary parties only arise from larger class developments. And I think we should have added here, he, 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 he doesn't uh, recommend centering around a party type forma uh, formation, but around a, a publication and a uh, a very loose center. Um, uh, in fact, the, the Russian uh, Social Democratic Labor Party from which the Bolsheviks arose started with tiny local groups. The trajectory of small propaganda groups to large parties is laid out well in Mick Armstrong's From Little Things, Big Things Grow. Um, today, there are thousands of Marxists who don't know what to do. They would like to see a revolution, but don't, don't know how to get there. They are critical of or leery about the DSA, but see no other large alternative. It is imperative for revolutionary Marxists to get off the sidelines and into the fray, not just as movement activists, but as open Marxists. We need to fight for influence in the struggles breaking out today. <clears throat> uh, Marxism is a broad category. There are many divisions and debates among Marxists. 
Some of these can and should be contained within an open, vibrant, uh, democratic revolutionary organization. Others, other differences are too fundamental. Trying to contain them in one organization would tie it up in interminable debates and preclude effective intervention and struggle. However, we should reject the blunt knife Marxism that attempts to avoid the key historical and theoretical questions that have rightly divided Bolsheviks from social Democrats, Stalinists, Maoists, and anarchists. What level of theoretical and strategic unity is right for our current predicament? The key is to unite around particular issues that are fundamental today. Obviously, there will be differences on what issues need to be united around, but here are the ones that we see as the, currently the most important. Number one, revolution from below. Proletarian methods of struggle, strikes, protests, occupations, uprisings, etc., are the best way to win reforms under capitalism and the best way to ready our forces for revolution. We reject the use of or support for capitalist parties and candidates. Working class independence from capitalist parties and and politics has been a cardinal principle of Marxism since Marx. Today, that especially means rejecting the use of or support of the Democratic Party, its candidates, or its ballot line. Uh, Marxists may run independent candidates and use elections as a way to spread socialist propaganda and advance and advance uh, mass fight back. Um, let's see, uh, I thought there was gonna be a but there, <laughs> but there wasn't. <laughs> um, uh, revolution from below also includes uh, an abolitionist stance on the police, prisons, the military and borders. We reject US patriotism and deference to the constitution or the law. Uh, two, uh, proletarian democracy. For Marx, socialism was, quote, the self-emancipation of the working class. And the, first step, and the first step toward it was, quote, winning the battle of democracy. Workers must be in charge of the politics and economics of society. We reject unde- undemocratic party dictatorships. We don't consider them socialists. Uh, these unde- undemocratic and therefore non-socialist states today include China, North Korea, and Cuba. Historically, they included Stalin's Russia, Mao's China, Vietnam, and the Eastern European states. For the label to mean anything, Marxists need to stand in the general tradition of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, and Luxembourg. Uh, So number three, international solidarity. Marxists must oppose the the imperialism of the country they reside in. However, internationalism also means opposition to all exploitation and oppression, no matter what ruling class carries it out. Marxists must reject campism, lesser evilisms, uh, sorry, uh, lesser imperialisms, and the logic of, quote, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. We say neither Washington nor Beijing, neither Moscow nor Tehran, but workers' power and international socialism. Internationalism also means full support of immigrant rights, open the borders. Uh, Number four, against oppression and exploitation. Many leftists separate the fight against exploitation from the fight against oppression. Marxists need to unite those fights and to reject both separatism and class reductionism. We must be, quote, the tribune of the people who is able to react to every manifestation of tyranny and oppression. That's Lenin, what is to be done, Um, which, I mean, this whole piece comes from it. (laughs) Uh, uh, We need to urge working class organizations uh, like unions to take up the demands of the oppressed. We critically support actual struggles against oppression, even if they are dominated by politics that we disagree with. However, we argue that only a unified working class struggle can bring liberation through socialist revolution. Uh, And then the final point, number five, rank and file union orientation. From the time of Marx, revolutionary socialists have supported labor unions as a way to limit exploitation under capitalism and to prepare the struggle against it. Marxists work within unions to increase democracy and militancy. We understand that the labor bureaucracy is a generally conservative layer whose 
influence ordinary workers need to organize against. So those are the five points. Uh, an effective Marxist, Marxist organization will limit its members to those who agree on the most important issues dividing the left today. These issues will shift over time and adjustments will need to be made. Within those parameters, there should be wide ranging debate. Wide ranging, yeah. Um, an organization that is too narrowly defined on too many points will not attract the number of people needed to be successful, nor foster the vibrancy necessary for a democratic organization that encourages debate and aims to develop self-confident critical thinking cadre. There's an imperative need for Marxist organization around the key political issues. The steps toward that will vary depending on the circumstances individual Marxists find themselves in. Where possible, Marxists should organize local groups that can begin the process of intervention and cadre, cadre building immediately. We need national organization, but we cannot wait for it to be built before also organizing locally. We have to do both. Struggle can be advanced by Marxist intervention now. There are revolutionaries and potential revolutionaries out there right now longing for what Marxists have to offer, the best tools for digging capitalism's grave. We need to find and organize them. We need to create interventionist propaganda groups that are serious about applying Marxism in struggle without assuming that they have all the answers and the full program that will be necessary at the time of revolution. Local organizations need to organize study groups and participate in and initiate struggle. Uh, we need to produce propaganda that relates to the moment. Uh, national connections between revolutionary groups can facilitate a division of labor so that each local group can use the resources of other groups. Uh, we need to organize a framework for interaction and support among these local organizations as the first step toward building a nationally unified Marxist organization uh, that we need as a step toward building <laughs> a revolutionary socialist working class vanguard party. Um, Marx, okay, lot, wrapping up here. Uh, Marxists today need to be flexible about vehicles for cohering re the revolutionary left and laying the basis for a larger, more effective organization. We should base our common efforts on agreement on principles, not on organizational fetishism or historical or theoretical differences that are not barriers to a common project. Awesome. That's all I got. Kick it to Steve. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jason. That was great. Um, so, the, as Jason said, these these debates have come up in the RSN, the Revolutionary Socialist Network, of which we're a part, but also in the new Revolutionary Socialist Organizing Project that uh, Justin Akers Chacon has um, started. And basically, the two projects I think are very similar in the sense that we started. Um, a little over two years ago after the ISO uh, collapse and saw the need for it still for a national revolutionary organization with the fundamental Marxist principles. So we began the process of setting up the RSN and in, the, in that process, a couple of other groups have joined. That is the um, uh, Workers' Voice and now um, uh, and Socialist Resurgence. Um, Speak Out Now is also part of the process with them left. So, there are people that come from the state capitalist tradition that are seeing Russia and China and so forth as state capitalists. And there are those who come from the tradition of seeing those states as what they call either degenerated or deformed worker states. And they're all in the same organization because they all agree today that there are no socialist countries and that we need international revolution everywhere. Um, so that's been the process. Now, some of the more what we usually call orthodox Trotskyists, that is people who believe in deformed or degenerated worker state analysis, have also an aspect of Trotskyism, which we pejoratively call programitis. That is the idea that you have to have, for, as a basis of a revolutionary organization, you have to have a fully developed or well-developed program, like Trotsky's 1938 uh, draft transitional program. Um, and they feel that if we can get this all nailed down, then people will come around the program. Um, our attitude has been, in contrast to that, that there are already 
many thousands of people out there who are who would consider themselves Marxist or who are very interested in Marxism, open to Marxism, um, very radical and willing to uh, get organized. And we need to appeal to those people, both people who have been in revolutionary groups, those who have not been in revolutionary groups, those who, you know, who've radicalized, you know, years and years ago or last summer around George Floyd or anything else. Um, and the way to do that is to bring people in on a basic fundamental Marxist program of which, you know, you look at the Denver communists, where we stand or the points of unity of the RSN or the SRS, uh, where we stand, they're fundamentally the same as those five points that um, uh, were just laid out by Jason. So um, we think that we can find people around those five points who might not necessarily be in favor of joining a group with a you know, 100 point program or whatever. Um, so that's been the approach that we've been taking. We um, have been taking the approach of more of a materialist orientation in the sense, and this flows from the, I, the way the ISO tried to organize, that is building cadre around basic Marxist ideas and you know, winning people to Marxism, to the application of it, um, understanding it, but also carrying it out in practice. And that can become the basis of a larger revolutionary socialist organization um, rather than having the perfectly developed program that everybody must adhere to and, and so forth before they can join. Uh, this has also been a, a difference in how people join organizations. So I believe in the case of the Denver communists, certainly in the case of Seattle Revolutionary Socialists, we have had a fund, well, let me just say about Seattle Revolutionary Socialists, the Denver folks can comment. And that is, we have had an introductory study group around the key basic points uh, at the end of that study group, you know, we've we've run this many, many times in the last couple of years. Um, people who agree with those points and want to be active and want to win other people to Marxism have been invited to join the organization. The only the only um, uh, definition of membership is agreement with the politics, being active around those politics, adhering to a code of conduct, which is basically solidarity ethics, if you will. Um, and uh, paying a small amount of dues. And we, we have belief that then people can learn Marxism in a deeper and deeper way through activity and organization rather than waiting outside the organization until they've read a whole bunch of books and then can, you know, then we can say that they're members or something like that. So that's kind of the approach that we've taken um, in Seattle that has resulted in a virtual tri tripling of our membership in the last uh, two years in Denver, a similar process has gone on. So I think we've I think we've shown that this approach works. Um, the other thing is we've had an orientation towards edu Marxist education and social movements because our attitude has been that the people most open to becoming uh, organized Marxists are those who have already taken a stand against capitalism in some way or another. That is. They are against racism in the George Floyd movement. They're for abortion rights and you know, women's liberation and so forth against the attacks. They're against US wars and so forth. So people who have done that, who've gone out on the streets and said, I am in opposition to the way this system is going. You know, even if they're not, they, you know, they haven't developed the full uh, critique, but they are at least taking a stand on some of these issues. Those are the people who are most open to revolutionary ideas and to organization. So that's been our approach, although we understand the need in the long term for uh, the working class to use its power at the workplace. We think the best way to get to that point is to recruit people who are beginning to be anti-capitalist and they can then organize in their workplace. So that's been our approach. Um, so. Anyway, that's that's kind of the so that's been debated in the Revolutionary Socialist Network and the Revolutionary Socialist Organizing Project. I think we go the other way in the sense that they're not yet convinced of the need for real organization. It's more like a discussion at this point. Uh, we don't know where it will go, but we want to be in in 
uh, and debate and discussion with people in the Revolutionary Socialist Organizing Project, as well as in the RSN and any other formations that come up. Um, I think the, the key is the local organizations, which can develop Marxist cadre and intervention. And from there, we can figure out where that goes nationally. I think we have to be open, flexible, and a bit agnostic. We can't have a detailed plan for how we're going to get to a revolutionary socialist vanguard party at this point. Uh, we just have to, you know, we just have to basically say the first thing you do in political organizing is clarify your ideas and then try to convince other people of those ideas. It's like the ABCs of political organizing, not just among Marxists, but for anybody, any political issue, that's what you're trying to do. So that's been the approach we've taken. Obviously, there's a